I could persuade you to believe what tonight I hope I well, I will try to. Your entire world would change. You hear the word God, the word Jehovah, the word Lord, the word Jesus, the word Christ, and you think of something other than yourself. One that is greater, one that you would worship. Tonight it is my purpose to show you that God and the eye of man are one. When you say I am, that is the God of Scripture. Confined as you are, you think, how could it be? God created the universe and sustained it. And here I am, like a little worm, three score in ten years, and then I vanish. But now let us turn to Scripture. We turn now to the 16th chapter of Matthew. And the question is asked of the disciples, the followers, those who have heard him. And he said to them, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they reply, well, some say, John the Baptist, come again. Others, Elijah. Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And the spokesman called Peter, answered and said, thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. He said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar -Jonah. for flesh and blood could not have told you this, but my Father who is in heaven. For here he equates the Son of Man with the eye of man. Not the organ that sees, or through which you see, but your sense of awareness. That I am this, when you are aware of being, your consciousness, your human imagination. So he equates the two, the Son of Man spoken of in the Old Testament, brought forward into the New, is nothing more than the I of man. And he calls it the Christ and defines Christ as the Son of God. Now we find Christ being defined in the New Testament as the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the eye of man is the power of God and the wisdom of God. If man does not know it, well then he will not exercise that power. He will not exercise that wisdom. So tonight I am trying to persuade you that when you say I, before you say anything, that that is the power and the wisdom of God. You can't separate the power of God and the wisdom of God from God. So you will say in the end, I and my Father are one, for he is called the Son of God. Now we are called upon to test this, if it be true. Can we test it? I hope you'll put it to the test. When I tell you that your own wonderful I am this is God, though prior to that you believe that you are little something, moving across the earth for a few years, 70 years, and then you will vanish in the hope of some restoration, but a hope. No assurance. But now I'm going to tell you that you really are God. Your own wonderful consciousness, your human imagination, that is the God of Scripture. And there is no other God. Imprisoned as you are in these bodies of flesh, you did it for a purpose. 
Now let us see what it tells us about this son of man that is now equated with the eye of man. No one has ever ascended into heaven but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. You'll read that in the third chapter, the 13th verse of John. So here we find you are a pre-existent being. No one can ascend into heaven but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Your ascension in the next verse, the 14th verse, is shown you how you were saved. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's all imagery, and yet it is true. You descended into generation in a world of death where everything begins waxes, it wanes, and then it disappears. But there's something in you, clothed in this garment that does die, that is pre-existent, and its home is heaven, which is harmony. You gave it up completely. You aren't pretending that you're a man. You descended into man. You became man. With all the weaknesses, all the limitations, all the restrictions of man, to experience this world of death and decay. There will come a moment in time that you will ascend from this restriction, taking with you the experience that is yours because of this restriction. And you will ascend in the same manner that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. That was an adumbration. That was a foreshadowing. You will rise from the base of your spine, up your spine, into your own skull, for heaven is within you. And you will rise like a fiery serpent without any loss of identity. The form you wear, I hesitate to describe it. I will tell you that your face is human, your hands are human, your voice is human, but do not ask me to describe the body that you wear. It's infinite power, infinite wisdom, and yet it is a form. You are that fiery being that descended, not because of anything that was wrong when you descended. The fall is not because of any mistake on our part. It's a predetermined plan to come down into the world of death and decay and overcome it. If coming down, wearing these garments, we knew who we were, pretending that we were men, we could not accomplish it any more than an actor on the stage pretending that he is Hamlet can actually play that part. He has to actually assume it, but even then it is still with a little something in his mind. He knows he is the great actor who tonight will go home to his lovely home and he'll take off the garment hang it up once more, and tomorrow he'll replay the play. You don't do that in this play of God. You don't take off the garment. You wear it for your three score in ten, and if by strength, your four score, or maybe even longer, or shorter. But the eye of man is the God of Scripture.